G'day, I'm Paul. So I'm a previous Model 3 performance owner. So, but I heard that there was a car coming to market that had similar performance specs, but was significantly cheaper. I thought, well, we've got to check it out. This is called the BYD Seal. This is the performance version. So top spec, and it delivers the performance that kind of lines it up against the Model 3 performance. So this competes with things like the Tesla Model 3, the Hyundai Ioniq 6, the Polestar 2, it's a sedan and that is the kind of market they're competing in. The SEAL performance is priced at just under $70,000, but if that's too expensive, the entire range kicks off at just under 50 grand. I mean, it is getting really affordable now to own an electric vehicle like this. So I'm excited to take it for a spin and see what it's like. Now, if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes that are on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we review a white car. Now, before we kick off, um, this is not a sponsored review. Um, this car, Long story short, we had to get a car from a dealer instead of a sort of traditional press car. So it's got sign writing on it, it's got a QR code, um, but that is why the car looks like it does. It's not sort of similar to other press cars that we review. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, in terms of design, uh, your optional colors are a bit expensive. So they start from 1500 bucks. So sort of well and truly above what else you'll find in this segment in terms of optional colors, but you don't have to pay that if you're happy to just stick with the standard color. On the design front, so uh, BYD has done what other brands, uh, other Chinese and, and Korean brands have done, where they've gone and taken designers from uh, big German companies to try and give them, I guess, the appeal that the Western markets like. And I think this is exactly on the money in terms of the design. It looks sensational here in person. They've taken a designer from Audi, and uh, I think he's done wonderful things here in terms of making this look like a stylish proposition that doesn't look like a science project. That's a mistake a lot of electric vehicle manufacturers make. They, they think, okay, electric vehicle, I have to make it look totally bizarre and weird. Whereas this uh, could have any badge on it really, and you would just think, hey, that's a nice looking BMW or Audi or whatever. So I think this looks really great. Now, down the front here, you've got full LED headlights. You've got an LED daytime running light, and this whole section here lights up as well. And you'll notice at the back as well, there's a pretty serious diffuser down there. So the performance version of this, zero to 100 in under four seconds. So they've tried to make it look as sort of sporty as possible. That continues on the side here as well. You've got a 19 inch alloy wheel. So four piston calipers, but cross-drilled rotors there. So it's a fairly serious set of braking hardware. And that is because this has some fairly serious performance as the sort of pinnacle of the uh, BYD seal range. Some aero covers there as well. I'll be keen to see how this goes around the right and handling track especially here on these eco contact tires they're probably not the best tire to extract the most performance out of a car so we'll see how that goes uh, byd design on the side here uh, you've got uh, indicator built into the wing mirror camera there as well nfc here i think we discussed this with the uh, byd Auto 3 review that we did so you've got nfc there and also inside the car as well uh, you've got door handles that pop in and out so when you lock the car they go back in and once you start driving they go back in as well I actually also really like, and I'll show you the sound of this later, the door slam noise. What they've done here is kind of tried to mimic the European cars, how they just have that confident, reassuring, solid thud when you close the door. So I'll show you that once we get inside. Uh, full glass roof, privacy glass. You've got your charging port here. I'll run you through the specifics on that shortly. Come around to the back with me. Now around the back here, full LED tail lights. They connect along the back there. So BYD seal. I've noticed as well that they've removed build your dreams. Uh, so the Addo 3 now just has BYD on the back of it. I saw one the other day, it looked pretty good. Um, all wheel drive to signify that it's a, a dual motor setup. But have a look at this. So they actually advertise your performance times, your acceleration times on the back of the vehicle, which is interesting. Pretty serious diffuser on the back there. Have a look at that. It's like it's a Formula One car or something. And then down the bottom there, you've got the camera and then the button there to release the boot. And have a look at this, no aerials on the back here. So it's all sort of pretty decent looking. The only downside to the no aerial design is that the radio reception isn't very good. You, know, you sort of start getting through the city and, and further out a little bit and it starts dropping out constantly. But you do have internet radio to back yourself up there. So let me know what you reckon about the design in the comments section below. Do you think it looks good? Do you think that this is enough value for money? Do you think it should be cheaper? I am keen for your feedback. Let me know in the comments section below. So we are sitting inside the seal. This is what the key looks like. You've got lock, 
unlock, a button there just for the rear boot, and then a remote start function, BYD on the back there as well. Uh, you can actually just use a card, and you can tap it on these NFC areas within the car, so you don't need to have the key if you don't want to. It is a proximity sensing key, so uh, once you're inside, you want to kick off, you've got a stop start button just here. Um, now, in terms of the way this interior looks, I think it actually looks incredibly premium for, for this type of car. And it's interesting to see that even with the base model, you're actually getting a lot of standard equipment. And when you sit here in this top spec version at just under 70 grand, it actually feels as premium as you know a $100,000 BMW. So I think they've done a great job in terms of kitting it out, making it look and feel uh, expensive. And that's what you want from a car in this segment. So that means uh, touch points are nice and soft. You've got this suede sort of material along the dashboard there big old glass roof as well. It is just a, a pleasant place to be seated in. And then there's giant infotainment screen that I'll run you through in a second. In terms of negatives though, um, this sort of looks a little bit cheap through here and you've got this button cluster here. Uh, I guess it is good to have actual buttons, uh, but yeah, they can be just a little bit tricky to see while you're driving because you've got to sort of look down where everything is. I guess you get used to that uh, once you are driving, but it's good to see a manual volume control there as well. Now, what about your touch points? Uh, that's sort of firm there. Soft on the door, we got a durometer here, tested the main surfaces in this cab, and if you do want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, look at the link in the description below. Now, build quality, what is that like? That all feels nice and solid there. That's nice and solid. Now, I mentioned the door slam before. Have a listen to this. That sounds very expensive. Now, let's talk infotainment. Actually, before I get into that, it's worth mentioning as well, this car comes standard with acoustic glass as well, which means it should reduce the amount of road noise we get inside the cabin. Uh, infotainment, so big display, just under 16 inches in size, and, and famously with BYD, you can rotate it, so uh, you can switch between those different orientations. I think it's probably one of those things you play with once or twice, but probably don't use it. Uh, let me know if you do own a BYD uh, at 03 or even a SEAL, do you ever really rotate the screen? Let me know down there in the comments section. Um, so this uh, infotainment system itself it's actually not too bad. So for the most part, it's quite easy to use. Uh, there are a couple of little bits and pieces that I don't love in terms of functionality. So for example, if you're putting in a nav address and you start sort of typing things in like, I don't know, Melbourne uh, Road, and then you want to hit space, the space bar is like tiny compared to the other letters. And it is a little bit tricky to actually uh, use while you're sort of driving. So I guess that is probably something just to keep, uh, keep in mind, but um, really not, not the end of the world there. Uh, outside of that, it's all sort of pretty straightforward, quite responsive and uh, pretty easy to use as well. In terms of other features, you've got Spotify built in, but unlike Tesla, you've got to have your own account here. You do have uh, 4G connectivity though, so it's able to um, stream music and all that sort of stuff if you do have an account or would want to listen to other sort of digital music sources. AM, FM, uh, DAB, digital radio. Uh, like I said before, the DAB doesn't really work that well once you leave the city. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's probably just an in-glass antenna, which means they don't really have the type of, uh, I guess, quality that you get out of a shark fin aerial that gives you better exposure to those uh, radio waves that these are picking up on. So that is one thing to keep in mind, but like I said, you can overcome that just by using internet radio. Then as you scroll through, you've got a stack of other functions here. So you've got the Assistant, which is just a voice recognition system. Uh, you've got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto that I'll show you in just a second, along with the ability to store uh, images, video, etc., on the actual internal storage as well. So pretty sort of decent setup there, and you can change the theme as well if you want to something a little bit different. This is also where you control the LED lighting within the car too to give you the, the feel and the vibe that you want. Uh, down the bottom here, you've got another few functions. So on and off for the screen, which is great, means it can go dark if you uh, want that. Also has a night and day mode as well. You can then switch between uh, different apps and also do split screen as well, which I think is, is a fantastic feature. So I think it is a uh, pretty nice setup there. Uh, I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. Wow, that is the biggest CarPlay integration I've ever seen. Very impressive. I like that. It's not too bad. Tiny bit laggy, but um, not too bad. Uh, and this is what Android Auto looks like. Look at that. So another full screen integration that actually looks really nice as well. So very impressive. Now ahead of the driver, you've got a smaller 10.25 inch display. This is what I'm loving about, uh, I guess, other EV brands that have just gone down the path of putting a small display here ahead of the driver. This one even has a head up display as well. 
just means that you don't have to take your eyes off the road constantly to look at this center screen. I think it's something that Tesla could really take advantage of because it is just a much better way to be operating a vehicle without having to worry about what's going on over here. So uh, big props to them for, for going down the path of that uh, driver display as well. So what about your safety? So they have thrown the kitchen sink at this. You've got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror. Blind spot monitor built into your wing mirrors. You have front and rear cross traffic alert. Radar cruise control with a lane assist, lane centering function, which we'll test later on. Uh, you've got front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera along with safe exit assist, which prevents you from opening the door if there is uh, vehicles or pedestrians or other stuff coming as you try and open the door. Uh, this is what the reverse camera looks like. So there it is there. Uh, you can do your 3D view like this. You can then also go to shortcutted views like that. Uh, you can then do a little transparency there. So that's looking out the front. That's looking out the back. The camera quality looks pretty good there. Sides. And it's just crazy how much uh, you actually can do here. So that's uh, quite an impressive setup. And this is what the horn sounds like. So moving on to practicality, we'll start off with your connectivity. So down here, you've got a USB-A port, USB-C port, 12 volts outlet, memory card slot as well. You have two separate Qi wireless phone chargers. You can actually enable and disable these. So if you just want to use it as a coin tray or something, you can actually switch one or both off, which I think is a great idea. In terms of storing your phone, it can kind of live anywhere really. There's a lot of storage around here. What about your coffee cup? So coffee cup goes in there very nicely but the other cool thing as well is if you do want to pop your bottle in if it's a long bottle like this you can actually just push that entire floor down so that you have more space in there and then it pops back up as required which is a good idea big bottle does it fit inside the door yes it does cool other storage you've got a little uh, coin tray over here next to the driver you've got a center console here that's reasonably sized storage down the bottom here also got a pretty reasonably sized glove box as well. So let's chat comfort. Uh, what I was pretty surprised by is that the entire range, including the base model, uh, comes with dual zone climate control, but also uh, heated and cooled seats and ventilated seats as well. So when you do step up to the top spec here, you're actually getting a heated steering wheel as well in addition to all of that. So a pretty comprehensive setup there. In terms of the seats themselves, they're pretty comfortable. They hug you in nicely. You've got electric seat adjustment for the driver and front passenger, so you can go forwards, backwards, your backrest can go forwards and backwards. Lift the front of the seat, the back of the seat, and then you have lumbar adjustment as well. Sorry about the flies, it's out of control here. Um, and then steering adjustment offers both tilt and reach adjustment. On our reach test, uh, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Now, second row, uh, given it's on a wheelbase of almost three meters, you actually have a decent amount of room here. So knee room is great. It does suffer from the trait that pretty much all of these sedan EVs suffer from, and that is a lack of toe room due to the height of the floor. Uh, headroom is okay, but if you're any taller than me, you'd probably be touching that glass roof. And on a hot summer's day when that's radiating heat, you're gonna be noticing that, I suspect. Um, down here, you've got other creature comforts like your USB-A and USB-C charging behind a little door. We've got matte pockets in the back of the seats here. Center armrest here with two cup holders. Uh, Isofix points on your two outboard seats with top tether points as well. It's actually a pretty comfy seat too. Uh, now, window test, does it go all the way down? So it's auto up and down. Oh, so close. Now let's talk cargo space. So pop the boot open with that button. A little bit slow. Um, you've got 400 litres of cargo space available. Worth keeping in mind that you have some underfloor storage here as well and a tyre repair kit, which you won't find on a Model 3. You've got 50 litres of storage under the front as well. I'll show you what it looks like with our bags in there. So there's one bag and there's our second. So pretty sort of deep size boot, but the sort of issue you're gonna find here, and you find this with pretty much all of these sedan based uh, EVs is that you just don't have a huge opening here. That is gonna be solved with Seal U, which is the SUV version of this vehicle. But um, there's still a pretty sort of decent load space there. Now, before we go for a spin, let me run you through our specifics on the battery and charging. So 84 kilowatt hour battery. 
On the charging front, you have both AC and DC charging. AC offers up to 11 kilowatts, three phase. DC, on the other hand, offers a maximum charge rate of 150 kilowatts with an average of just under 100 kilowatts. So on charging, it's not that amazing. If you look at a lot of the other vehicles in this segment, especially those with 800 volt architecture, they're able to charge much quicker and for better intensity. But it is worth keeping in mind, this uses an LFP battery. So it means that you can actually run it and charge it through to 100% more often. Uh, as opposed to a lithium ion, a tr traditional lithium ion battery. Um, and that also means that it doesn't have the best charge rate as well. So uh, it's not the end of the world, but that is one of the small compromises you're gonna have to make. In terms of the WLTP drive range, it's a little over 500 kilometers, which I reckon is pretty good as well. So we have just hit the road in the seal. Now this is an impressive setup because you've got entry level single motor, uh, that's all sort of pretty straightforward. But as you step up here to the performance version, you've got pretty impressive power output. So twin motor, one on the front axle, one on the rear axle, they produce a combined 390 kilowatts of power and almost 700 newton meters of torque. So it is an incredible amount to be sort of running through a vehicle like this. And uh, just here from behind the wheel, even in normal mode, when you pin the throttle down, holy moly, it absolutely moves. So uh, it's quite impressive that they've been able to dial all of this into a package that is under $70,000, which I reckon is pretty, pretty incredible. So what does all that sort of mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, the good thing with uh, electric vehicles like this is typically you get your uh, energy losses when it comes to the, the fancy tires, uh, sort of bigger rims and all that sort of stuff. What they seem to have done here is done away with a lot of that to sacrifice top speed. So it has a top speed of 180 k's an hour. If you compare that to something like a Model 3 performance that goes over 200 k's an hour, you have to dial in additional measures to ensure the car's capable of doing over 200 k's an hour. And as a result of that, you end up consuming more energy as it goes. So this isn't as efficient as the mid-spec version. So uh, you do lose out a little bit there, but it's not the big leap that you get with some performance versions of cars. And that means that the official claim is just under 17 kilowatt hours per 100 k's. Uh, we are currently sitting on uh, 21.3 kilowatt hours per 100 k's, and that includes three hot laps that we did this morning. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that figure. I'll be keen to see what it's like after a bit more driving, see if that settles down, uh, because one of the advantages the Model 3 does have and, and other sort of Tesla products and Hyundai products as well, is that they are incredibly efficient uh, when they are running. So I'll be keen to see what this is like over a longer distance with a bit more sort of highway and city driving as well. And just as a side note as well, I do love on this screen here, when you are flicking between these menus, it's a bit hard to see because this camera is not exactly the best angle, but I can adjust fan speed here, temperature here as well. So they really have quite uh, thought about a lot of this stuff so that it is much easier to use while you're driving. Now let's talk about suspension. So this uses a passive uh, damping setup. So it means that it can adjust the damping rates uh, while you're driving, similar to what they have in the Kia EV6 GT. It's not an adaptive setup, but uh, it sort of can work with different road surfaces quite quickly. And if we dial this up to 130 k's an hour now, I'm curious to see what this feels like. So there's 130. Yeah, that is pretty bouncy. Uh, what I noticed in and around the city, the ride is on the firmer side of comfortable. They've dialed in just a little bit of sportiness to it, but it's not over the top. And as a result of that, it is uh, getting sacrificed here over stuff like our sine waves, which are there to give you an extreme indication of what this vehicle's like if you do an overtake or you do a bit of country driving where you're gonna find those choppy roads. And that was the big difference there between the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which hadn't been locally tuned, and the EV6, which had been locally tuned. You could feel a day and night difference between those in terms of how they handle that type of terrain on such a long wheelbase. So potentially just a little bit of ride and handling tuning here for Australia would actually work wonders. Let's go over our bumpy road. So we do this at 90 k's an hour. Gives us an idea of what this is like if you find yourself on a country road that's full of corrugations. We've got a high frequency sound wave here as well. Sine wave rather. Okay. Yeah, nice. That's the benefit of the softer suspension tune. It's just a little bit more composed over this stuff. And look, to be honest, I'm happy for them to sacrifice the handling capability a bit to give you this ride comfort because 
that's where a lot of the competition falls down. They try and dial in way too much firmness with EVs because they have such a low center of gravity. They're typically heavy. This is uh, 2.1, 2.2 tons. So a lot of weight to be controlling through a corner and um, they try and sort of manage it with firm suspension. Whereas I think this is a good compromise. Yes, it is a tiny bit sloppy there in terms of body control on a sine wave, but for the most part, it's actually not too bad. Now let's talk about drive modes. Um, regardless of which drive mode you're in, when you open up the taps, it really pins you back in the seat. But you do have two levels of regen. I've got it in high regen at the moment. There is no single pedal driving. I suspect that'll come as a software update. But you've got normal sport and eco. I've just slotted it into sport. Let's go for a spin around our track and just see what this feels like. Jeez, it really has some impressive acceleration. Brake pedal feel is good. It's doing that ridiculous thing where it puts hazard lights on the drop of a hat. Now this actually has a torque vectoring system as well. So while it's driving, it's, uh, it's basically shuffling uh, braking forces as required around those four wheels and um, a little bump there mid corner. Actually does a decent job when you sort of tip in and you're on the throttle, it's able to limit torque to one of the wheels to just tuck it in nicely. Steering feels good. You've got two levels of steering feel there. I've just left it in comfort. Yeah, the ride is a little compromised when you do get those bumps mid-corner. But it is doing remarkably well here in terms of pace. We had the uh, Mustang Mark E GT here recently and this thing, is, this thing is moving as quick if not faster than that. Open up the taps on our back straight here. <laughs> this thing is a rocket ship. Holy crap, that is amazing. That is genuinely impressive, uh, the way that performed just then. Really just picks up pace remarkably well. And through the corners, you know, it doesn't sit totally flat. It has that sort of little bit of element of um, sort of body roll dialed in there. But when you do get on the throttle, it's actually very well sorted. Uh, MG4, the X Power, the fast one, when we drove that around here, that had a torque vectoring system and some kind of a limited slip differential on the rear axle and just didn't really have itself sorted, especially with the stability control. It kept biting and was just really cumbersome and annoying to deal with. This, on the other hand, when you do sort of throttle out of a corner there, you can feel the torque vectoring system working, but it's working in unison with stability control, and it means that you're not getting stupid events where it's doing funny stuff mid-corner. Actually feels really well sorted with some pretty decent steering feel. So they have put a lot of effort into the ride and handling element here. I just think it needs just a little bit of tweaking on the suspension there. If they just made it a slight bit firmer uh, and just adjusted that progressive rate a little bit, I think that it would actually be quite impressive. And these tyres are also the weak point too. These are an eco tyre. If they actually strapped a decent set of uh, treads to this, I reckon you'd be doing some pretty decent pace around a track, especially for an LFP battery. Typically these vehicles have um, lithium-ion batteries that that just uh, give you that extra sort of discharge performance. This is getting along nicely for an LFP vehicle. Now let's talk about visibility. So I can see clearly down the front of the car there, the wing mirrors are pretty reasonably sized. Visibility out the back isn't amazing, but it's fine for what it is. When it comes to parking, it's pretty straightforward with all of the cameras that you've got access to. Now in terms of road noise, I was actually pretty impressed with this. Uh, this is how it went up against our calibrated sound meter, but having stuff like laminated glass really makes a difference when it comes to just getting the noise levels down in the cabin. It's on an eco tire as well, so lower rolling resistance and better uh, noise insulation too. Okay, so let's have a look at our semi-autonomous systems here. Uh, we'll get this up to 70 k's an hour, which is typically what we do. So there's 70 k's an hour there. So what we want to do is just see how well this is willing to hold the lanes on the three outer lanes of our banked oval here. Typically, the sort of more banking you have, the more torque it has to apply, and that typically resembles what it's like out on the road. Now, I drove this car here today, so I know what it's like on the road, so I'll, I'll tell you what that's like in just a second, but lane one here is fine. Jump over to the next lane. That's active. It's doing a pretty decent job there as well. Jump over to our highest lane. And see what this is like. We'll just wait for that to go green. Yeah, all right, we're still waiting. Still waiting. Yeah, it doesn't 
look like it's going to work up here. So, yeah, look, I'll share my experiences with you. I, um, I just had a lot of issues with uh, how well the system worked. It was constantly just fighting me with the steering wheel. And I think a lot of that is this emergency lane keeping assistant. Uh, so whenever you wanted to change lanes, it sometimes wouldn't recognise that you were changing lanes and would try and shunt you back in. It's quite a frustrating system. So, uh, And then the lane support stuff didn't really work all that well either. So, yeah, look, I think it goes to show you some of this stuff definitely could do with some additional work and hopefully that's part of a software update that they can actually roll out. Okay, I've been looking forward to this. Let's do a little bit of performance testing. Hey, before we do, I just wanted to tell you about our website. We've actually got a stack of uh, great buying tools to help you find your next car. If you just go to Google and type in Help Me Car Expert, you'll be able to use our comparison tool. We've built out comparisons on a stack of different vehicles. We've even got a car chooser. If you don't know what you want, you just put in all the fields, it'll help you. And then we have a stack of vetted dealers as well to help you find a car that's in stock and get you a good deal. So uh, BYD claims a zero to 100 time of just under four seconds. So this thing is pretty quick in that regard. So I'm gonna slot this into sport mode. I'm also gonna switch off uh, ESC just to give us a bit more juice off the line there. I've got it in uh, auto hold mode and then I'm just going to stand on the throttle. We'll see how that goes and I might even do another run if the time's no good with um, with brake holding as well. We'll see what happens. So here we go. Go all the way through to 120. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. All right, there's 100. 120. That is, that is decently, decently quick. All right. Let me come to a stop and see how that went. Now, there you go. So ESC switches itself back on at a certain speed by the look of it. Um, so 0 to 100, 3.92 seconds. So almost the claim. And then 80 to 120, 2.59 seconds. So it is still absolutely hauling while it's going there. So I might try to do that one more time just with holding the brake and the throttle and we'll see if that makes any difference. Okay, so this time around what I'll do is just hold the brake and the throttle. I can hear the engine fan has kicked on there, so I think it's not liking me, so I'm just gonna let go of the brake. Oh, very nice. All right, there's 100, and then 120. Okay, okay. Come to a stop there. Oh, that fan has really kicked on now. Uh, so, zero to 100 that time around, 3.92 seconds again identical so yeah it doesn't seem to make too much of a difference so uh, let's go back and do a stop from 100 k's an hour okay here we go Ooh. very nice and strong so 100 to zero 2.75 seconds 37.07 meters so yeah, not a bad effort there at all. And now, our reverse acceleration test. How fast will it go in reverse? Oh, pretty modest. 26 kilometers an hour. So, BYD SEAL. I am genuinely, genuinely blown away by this. Under $70,000, and you are getting a lightning fast performance. Uh, you know, it is... Just unheard of. Nobody would have thought that uh, a few years ago, under 70 grand would get you a car that does zero to 100 in under four seconds. It's fitted out really nicely inside. The tech's pretty good. It is really hard to complain. If I did have to complain though, there are some things that I'd point out. So it needs faster charging. I also did notice as well, after we'd done a few laps around the track, the battery started derating. So it means that it wasn't giving me the same punch that it does when it's cold or when it isn't as hot. And that tells me that the LFP battery is probably good for a few short bursts and then it tapers off after that. And that could be the reason that other manufacturers are sticking with lithium ion for their performance products. But if that's not too important for you. The car delivers in terms of ride and handling. It's punchy when it needs to be and it has has all the tech to keep you busy as well. So is it better than a Tesla Model 3? Look, I need to drive the updated Tesla Model 3. I haven't driven that just yet, but this really represents excellent value for money. And I think if you were to compare them like for like in terms of how much you're paying, this is a far better value proposition. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you bought a BYD seal? What's it like to live with? Are you enjoying it? Some of those safety aids are really annoying. I just switch them off every time I drive them so that'll get a little bit frustrating over time, but I'm keen for your feedback. 
If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well. But until next time, take it easy.